Welcome to SuperCloud 6 AI Founders Day. I'm Howie Xu. I'm a serial entrepreneur and an executive in AI and the cloud space for a very long time. Today, I'm welcoming two distinguished guests, and I wanted to discuss AI and the cloud today. So, Amar, you are the founder CEO of Vectera, and Yang Qing, founder CEO of Laptum. So, I want you, the two of you, first uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, you're very well known in the space, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you start this company, because you have done a lot in the past, but why you want to start this company. Let's, let's start with Alma. Yeah, this, <clears throat> this is actually my third startup. So I had a couple of startups before. Uh, I had one startup that I started in 1999 that was acquired by Yahoo in 2000. Uh, and then at Yahoo, my, uh, I spent eight years at Yahoo until 2008. Uh, my career shifted more towards uh, big data, machine learning, and data science. And out of Yahoo, I started uh, Cloudera uh, because I saw an inflection point with new technologies like Hadoop that enable us to spread computation over many, many uh, servers. We called them pizza boxes back then. And uh, do very high performance computing tasks, uh, leveraging normal hardware as opposed to building a supercomputer. So that that's why it was my second startup, Cloudera. Uh, Cloudera went all the way to be a public company, and uh, a, couple of a couple of years ago, they got acquired by a private equity firm. Uh, and then uh, after Cloudera, I uh, joined uh, Google Cloud for two years. I was vice president of developer relations over there. And while I was there, I got to experience uh, the very first large language models that they had internally. Uh, they had a system called uh, MENA. Uh, that was the code name of the system they had. And I got to have many conversations with MENA. That was like two years before uh, ChatGPT came out. And it was very clear to me that one, this is gonna change the world. Like this is the truly like uh, AI at a level that we have never seen before. But second, it hallucinates and makes up stuff all the time, which means you won't be able to use it in the business without a solution that keeps uh, these hallucinations and factual inconsistencies uh, under control. And uh, that was the premise for why uh, Victara was created. So Victara is about trusted Jenny AI, which means how can we have large language models that we can trust uh, to be part of our business. Cool, we'll get to more into that because there are a lot of the technical details I would love to dive into, right? Because, you know, like you said, hallucination, it's hard a problem to solve. How do you solve and how big a problem it is? Mm -hmm. But before that, you know, Yang Qing, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you get here. Yeah, uh, thanks, Howie, for inviting me. Basically, I'm Yang Qing, and uh, uh, I'm right now running a small startup called Lepton AI, which started actually only last year. Um, I kind of started doing AI in my PhD days, basically, back at Berkeley. And uh, so back in 2012, Alex Krzyzewski has this famous AlexNet paper coming out, and no, everyone's basically looking for software. And, and back then, we wrote a small piece of software called Cafe, which was relatively popular um, back in the days. And uh, then my career went from actually doing AI research to doing AI system research, quote unquote. Uh, I've been through Google, Facebook, run, running Facebook's AI infra over there, and then in the last four years, running Alibaba's big data and AI work as a VP and general manager. Um, one thing that we saw very clearly is um, the AI computation pattern is very different from the conventional cloud and also data infra. And um, it's more similar to the old school high performance computation or scientific computation, if you think about it. Very highly connected networks, uh, very high performance, high utilization of the machines and things like that. It's no longer just moving data around, like moving videos and images and text around. It's all about crunching float numbers as fast as possible. In fact, um, NVIDIA's last year, well, yesterday NVIDIA actually talked about their newest, you know, biggest computer and things like that, which looks like all those supercomputers which used to be doing weather simulation, like physics and all those kind of things, right? So in Alibaba Cloud, we started actually seeing a surge in the, the new hardware and software architecture that will allow us to basically run large language models and all those other AI models, both training and inference. Um, and so we figured, similar to what Cloudera did in the uh, big data world, basically, I think AI is very quickly becoming the third pillar in the IT infrastructure. I think cloud starts basically being you know, like serving web traffic and it's really well. And then data infra deals with the large amount of data that's accumulated via web services. That's and today, Snowflake, data Snowflake data the is the new generation today, basically, of course. And then basically, I think AI is 
guaranteed, at least I believe, to be the third. So <laughs> Definitely, thanks so much. Yeah. So the third pillar would be Leptun and Vectera of the world. Yeah. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> By the way, it's very interesting. We have a common investor, actually, Fusion Fund. Right? Fusion Fund is great, yeah. There's a common investor in both of us. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So, you know, mm -hmm. two of you are PhDs you know, in this space for a very long time. So let's get into the weeds a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, so last year, last December, uh, CNBC had an article, you know, the article, the title was like uh, 2023, uh, a hefty profit year for NVIDIA and then uh, lofty experiments for the rest. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, you have to think, hey, why, right? Why a lot of the experiments, right? People have been talking about Gen AI applications, you know, already one and a half years or so but not too many productions, you know, deployed. So there got to be some complexity, difficulty, mm -hmm. right? So you mentioned the Vectora, you know, you started Vectora seeing that, hey, hallucination, all those things. Can mm -hmm. you actually just give us some rundown? What are the, why it's so hard to productize, to, to do Gen AI applications? Yeah, so for, first I'll note, it's a natural cycle that you see the hardware vendors lead the curve before the rest of the market catches up and even exceeds them actually at some point in many ways. So a very market cap? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 collectively, collectively. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully Victoria alone can reach that level of market cap. But if you, if you look at, uh, uh, like we've seen this story before, so if you look at the, the beginnings of the internet with companies like Sun Microsystems yeah. and uh, Cisco, yeah. they had valuations that were through the roof and they were selling left and right. Because they were Cisco selling was the largest market cap company in yeah. 2000. And they're still not back to that. They're <laughs> still, still not back to the level they were at in 2000, which again, that's why we have, to very be cautious. we have to be very cautious investing in NVIDIA, I would say. Like, you get this very hungry demand at the beginning of a new technical movement where people move towards the, the hardware vendors, but they very quickly realize that the value is in the application, software. So the software you can build with that. Mm -hmm. so yeah, so Cisco was great, Sun Microsystems was great, but then out of that internet beginnings, came Google, came Facebook, came way, way, way bigger uh, opportunities and way, way bigger market caps out of the, uh, the technological wave that these companies uh, enabled. So I just want to caution with that, like NVIDIA is the canary in the gold mine. Like I look at NVIDIA right now, what we're seeing with them as the signal that there is a massive, massive market coming. And if investors don't wake up and try to take leverage of that, they will be left behind. And by the way, all of them are waking up and uh, seeing that Gen AI is of course very important. So with that preamble, the reason why Gen AI is hard is uh, for a number of, re a number of issues that you uh, need to solve before you can use it in the enterprise. Uh, the first one is hallucinations, as we discussed. Is these models can make up stuff, and they make it up in a way that sounds very, very uh, authentic or very uh, accurate when it's completely inaccurate, which is very dangerous, right, when you have a system that can do that. Uh, and there's many ex embarrassing examples of that that we have seen in the press, like airlines uh, giving away tickets for free because somebody tricked the chatbot into hallucinating a free offer. Uh, lawyers getting disbarred because uh, they had cases, prior art cases in their uh, lawsuit filing that Which were completely exist. made up and was not, did not exist. So clearly uh, that um, gave the market a pause. Like all the companies looked at that and said, oh, I'm not sure I can have something like that in my business, right? And that was one of the key problems that Victoria angled on, not only how can we reduce hallucinations, but also how to measure them. So with every response you're getting back from our system, you can tell this is a high confidence response, meaning I can take this and put this in my legal draft, or put this in my email, or put this in my investment memo, or my medical diagnosis with confidence. Or we'll tell you, no, this is medium confidence, meaning a human should review this first before you can, you can use it. So that, that was needed, we have that today. Uh, second, uh, to be able to use uh, Gen AI in any regulated industry like finance, uh, law, accounting, medical, you need what's called explainability. Explainability has to be part of the system. You cannot just tell me this is the answer. That doesn't work. You have to explain why is this the answer? Which documents, which, uh, what's the provenance, the lineage of how you made this decision that you're recommending to me right now? So that was a big gap that is now uh, our, our company provides a solution to and a number of others have solutions for. Third, the security is a very big issue. So these uh, large language models are susceptible to what's called prompt attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, so prompt attacks are uh, uh, us humans tricking the large language model with our words to get it to confess something to us that we're not allowed to see. So let's say you have, there's certain data in the large language model that you are allowed to see, but there's a big chunk that you are not allowed to see. Then he would come in and would say, I'm going into a meeting and I need answers for these questions. And then the system would answer it as if it's answering for you and he gets to see the answers, right? So that, that now leaks information out of the system. 
So uh, again, that, that is a no-no in business. You cannot have that. In business, uh, the person asking the question, their identity, not the way they say things, their identity should be the, the enabler of, of the access control that controls the system that's providing back the response. So all of these were, there's a number of other gaps like that. Uh, so hallucination, explainability, security. Yeah. So I have two very specific questions, right? Uh, one is, you know, I personally have been doing Gen AI applications in various places, right, in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very obvious to me, of course, today, right, it wasn't obvious a year and a half ago, uh, it's pretty easy to get to accuracy of 50 50%, 55%, right, with a yeah. little bit of work, you know, smart engineers, never done even any AI stuff, right, you can get into it. Yeah. But once you go from 50, 60%, exactly. go to the 80, 85, 90%, and you feel like, wow, this is uphill battle, right, exactly. steeper and steeper. Yes. So what's your advice to the developers out there? I know that, you know, you already have some customers, you're already yeah. working with people. Yeah but not 100% people working with Vectera, right? So to the audience out there, right, what, what's, what's their hope? What, what should they, what should they yeah. look at it, right? So first, I'm biased, obviously. Uh, my advice to them is come work with Vectara. We solve this problem. We know how to give you very, very high quality results. But many of them don't believe And whoever is, whoever is watching Super Cloud Assist gets a discount. <laughs> <laughs> The, the problem is many of them don't believe us when we say that, right? Because of, there are so many tools out there that make it uh, simple to build a prototype. And they think because they can build a prototype that they can make this work in production. So we warn them. We actually tell them, many of our customers, the way it works with them is we have the first meeting, and they will say, oh, no, we can do this ourselves. Well, I'm sure. Go, go ahead. Try to do this yourselves. You're going to come back and complain about many things. First, you're going to complain that the quality is not very good. The results, garbage in, garbage out, like we say. The results you're getting back are not good results. Second, you're going to have hallucinations. Third, you're not going to be able to explain the response. Fourth, you might have copyrighted material in the response. All the issues That's you it. mentioned. We highlighted all to them, and then we let them go fail. So they spend a couple of months building it themselves. Uh, they, they think they're doing a great job. They show it to their business users. Their business users start to use the system. And they it's a see, sexy demo. Yeah, it's a, but once they use it in production, they're like, what is this? This system is inaccurate. It's making wrong answers all the time. And that's when they come back and say, OK, can we, can we please work with you? <laughs> can you show us a solution that works? And the, uh, the, the nutshell answer for why it's hard, because across that pipeline of building an efficient, what we call a RAG pipeline, a retrieval augmented generation pipeline beginning to end, there is many, many models. It's not just one model that you need to get working right. There is many models that you have to get working right in unison with proper feedback and proper back, back propagation across of them. Uh, so it's very, very hard for the average uh, uh, system developer or average engineer to be able to fine tune a system like that. In fact, even the ML experts, it's hard for them to tune. By the way, just for Vectera, right, you do the RAG system, right? Vector database, embedding model. Yes. Do you do your own uh, large language model as well, or you just use the frontier models like uh, OpenAI of yes. the world? Excellent question. So the answer is yes and no. So RAG is about retrieval augmented generation. Yep. So there's more than one model, as I said. For the retrieval, we have our own model. So for retrieval, we have our own model called Boomerang. And Boomerang is one of the top models in the world in terms of being able to re retrieve text based on the meanings behind the text, not keyword matching at yep. all. But you still need to do some key matching as well. So we do hybrid, actually, between Boomerang and, and keyword matching to get the perfect, perfect results. We have another model that does the scoring of the results. Like once you get the results back, you need to now correlate these results back with the prompt and rank them with the right order. This is the first good result, second good result, third good result. And you need to calibrate the score because that's how you're going to decide, oh, no, I should not answer this question. I'm going to make up stuff versus, yes, this is a high confidence result. I can use that to answer the question. And then once you have that, you feed that into the generative model. For that, we use other generative models. Uh, we start with an existing generative model like Llama. We fine tune it, and that's what we use there. Uh, it's foolish to go and build a, a foundation model from scratch that costs $30 million to, to build, so why not leverage the open source when it comes to that? And then the output of that goes to another model that we built ourselves, which is the hallucination evaluation model. It's the top model in Hugging Face right now if you search for hallucination. And what that model does is factual consistency checks. That's your model? Yes. That's and also you open sourced that model? Yes, and we open source that model. So that model reads the output of the system and compares the output back with the facts that were retrieved, and that's how it gives you the score saying, this is a high confidence response, this is a medium confidence response, or this is a low confidence response. So one more quick question, right? You, know, you mentioned you give the confidence score, but in the enterprise world, uh, statistically correct doesn't, still is not enough, right? If even something is 98%, 99%, or 99.5% correct, it's not enough for me, because I wanted this to be 
100% right, 100% right. Well, it depends the on the use case. So you're right, but it depends on the use case. For example, uh, in a medical kind of situation, 100% correct is the, so the threshold is very high, and that's why we calibrate the thresholds to be very high in that case. But in that case, do you think that's a Gen AI use case? Yeah. Yeah, Still yeah. a Gen AI use yeah, case. Despite but, but you have a trade-off now. You had a trade-off because if you increase your bar on the accuracy of the result, then there might be uh, less questions you're able to answer. There will, you will abstain from answering or more mm. questions. So there's a trade-off between these two things, right? So if you say, I want 100% accuracy, then there will be now, uh, out of 100 questions you could answer, maybe you'll only answer 60% of them. Because the remaining 40, you're not sure you can achieve the 100%. Uh, versus if you're using it for a marketing use case and publishing marketing sure. for our website, it's okay to have 5% uh, <laughs> marketing people make up stuff And anyway. a hallucination <laughs> is a feature anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's okay to say, no, it's okay now my threshold for accuracy be 80% so I can answer all 100% of the tasks that I'm trying to do. So it depends on the use case. The, the good thing is we give our uh, customers the ability to uh, balance these things, right? So they can control them depending on the use case they're after. So we'll come back to more details. Uh, Yang Qing, so... Right. Um, Amar just give us uh, the rundown of the complexity of you know, writing the Gen AI applications, exactly, right? Yeah. So once you write it, you still have to deploy it, deploy that at scale. Right. You know, there are a lot of complexity over there. Can you give us you know, your, the pinpoint in, that, in, in that, that side of the world? Right. I think basically the community has actually gone very far in terms of like optimizing the runtime and things like that. There are also some libraries coming from, like, say, Berkeley, my uh, PhD school, right, um, called VLLM and things like that. Uh, basically, I think what we are seeing is, one, how do we actually reliably run those models um, at scale and high performance? And the other one is how do we actually establish a way to evaluate what is the best or the most econo economic way of doing it, right? Kind of similar to you know, like in the past, we can, we can actually launch rockets already like 50 years ago, but, even, but, but only today when SpaceX made it like really economic and things, yep. when it scales. It scales. Right? It scales. Right. So yeah, so I think you know, like a few challenges over there. One is basically the hardware has been evolving really quickly. And uh, um, to the extent that the software is yet to catch up, like you said. Yeah. Um, yesterday, NVIDIA basically said uh, they have the new DGX that's running at one exaflops. Now, in 2017, we actually wrote a paper back at, back at Facebook called Training Image in an Hour. That was like one of the fastest approaches. The total compute in that hour is one exaflop, meaning that basically you'll be able to train, in theory, just in theory, yeah. right? Yeah, you can actually train that model in one second. Of course, we know that it's probably not possible right now, mainly because smashing all those software, millions or tens of millions of function calls and things like that into that one second is extremely difficult. So today, when we are actually looking at the fast runtimes for LLMs, we actually do quite a lot of uh, work, such as batching the request at the same time, such as a speculative decoding, meaning that using very small models to actually predict what the next word should be and have the larger model just do verification instead of produ production and things like that. We need to basically pack multiple CUDA calls into one single CUDA call so that you know things get more 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 efficient and they don't those kind of CUDA kernels as we call it don't have to wait for each other inside that driver, and all those kind of things actually made us able to run something like ten times more efficient than some of the uh, some of the vanilla models and also I think maybe three to five uh, three to five five times faster than the uh, the the best open source solutions. There's also quite a lot of you know, like tools around those kind of runtimes. It's not only just one single engine. You can basically smash this engine into like one big box of eight GPUs and get the fastest speed, for example. But then it's going to be a little bit luxurious. It's as if basically you're just like... If you, you can know, ever find eight GPUs for... <laughs> if you could even find eight GPUs, exactly, because GPUs are such a, a shortage right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Imagine if you're driving a Lamborghini to get like a yeah. nail from Home Depot. It yeah, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense. sense. Yeah. And uh, one of the key challenges right now in AI is, like you said, it's um, the applications actually do not generate a lot of money. It's not like one LM question and answer is going to be like given yeah. like ten dollar revenue, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, we will have to actually run it in a very economic way yeah. because a lot of the applications are actually doing productivity, not really generating direct revenue. It's increasing the productivity efficiency of people who were used to be doing those kind of tedious and repeated job, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, and so basically, you know, like how do we actually run the AI models at scale under the SLA requirement, not any faster, but fast enough and then cheap enough yeah. kind of situation. That's like pretty important. Yeah. So we built this cloud data platform allowing people to actually naturally evaluate and find the best balance. Of course, we have the fastest runtime, but I think most proud things like we have the Lamborghini, but 
most proudly we have the Camry in some <laughs> way, right? So people can actually choose among this spectrum, mm -hmm. find out the best way to launch models, and then when they decide how to do so, we have the cloud native platform to allow people to seamlessly scale things, actually like like to to to, to monitor the performance, to make sure that all those kind of old and uh, old and good SRE kind of work can be done without too much So work. one thing I'm curious yeah. is about mm -hmm. what's the alternative for developers out there, right? right. You know, yeah. In Omar's world, as, as we discussed, there are plenty of blogs, you know, there's a long chain, there build is, yourself. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Llama Index, you can build yourself, right? Mm -hmm. right. In yeah. your world, what is, mm -hmm. the, like, what is the alternative if, if right. they don't work with? Great question, uh, yeah, right. So basically, there are honestly quite a lot of like really good solutions mm -hmm. out there. Um, I think one year ago, what people had to do is basically to find a GPU, SSH into it, install PyTorch and all those kinds of things, and start basically running the model themselves and hope that it doesn't go down. Today, first of all, there is quite a lot of open, uh, like open AI compatible APIs. So if people are already using open AI, then these APIs are having the exact same function signature. You just need, you just need to like change the URL and you're good, at, good to go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the price is actually interestingly uh, raised into the bottom, especially for the public models, that, such as like Mixtro or Lama and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I think for experimentations, it's really good. Uh, a lot of the tools, such as Lunchain, Lama Index, Vercel AI SDK, has already have those kind of things embedded. Mm -hmm. and in addition to that, what we allow people to do is basically to run their dedicated models, either fine-tuned or actually like trained from scratch kind of models efficiently as well and have their own hardware and, uh, and software strategies. It's kind of similar to if people use Cloudera, Hortonworks, and things like that, um, people will, will be able to define their own yes. like table architecture and things like that and run their own uh, SQLs, but there is a very worry-free platform exactly. to help people to do all those kind of experimentations, productization, and stuff like that. So yeah, I, well, I want to add something on this. So. Hmm. Uh, one of the one of the biggest concerns actually that many organizations have is lock-in. They're very worried about lock-in right mm -hmm. now. So they were, with data, you have some lock-in, but you always can you always can move your data somewhere else. Exactly. So it's yep. expensive, but it's not impossible. But with fine-tuning a model, if I'm fine-tuning a model at OpenAI, and OpenAI holds the weights of the model, and I stop working with them, then my business stops because because I have to go fine-tune from scratch somewhere else. So the lock-in factor is huge, and that's concerning mm -hmm. a lot of the large enterprises. And that's yeah. why they're leaning more towards, no, we want to build and run and train our own models so we can control the weights of these models and hence control our destiny. So that's, that's a, a very, Lama, Mistral. Yes. Start with Lama or Mistral now, I guess, or Grok. No, Grok. <laughs> and right. Google has like Gamma as well. Or Gamma, yeah. And yeah. also yeah. Elon, Gamma, Elon has Gamma, Grok. Yeah, seven right. is great. And Grok. Yeah, there's so many yeah. good options. That, thanks to all of these companies. For so what, you two, what two of you are seeing people more and more towards the open model now? Yes um, and no. I mean, GPT-4 is still the best. Like, I'll, I'll be honest with you, in, in terms of hallucination rates, in terms of accuracy, reason and planning, GPT-4 is still uh, the best of the best. So it depends on exactly the analogy uh, that Chang Jing gave around, do you want the, 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 the Ferrari or do you want the Camry? So it depends right. on the use case. For right, some use right. cases, you really need the Ferrari, right. for, uh, like medical, for example. For right. some other use cases where you're serving some questions on your website, uh, the Camry is good enough. Right. Then the open source models will work fine. So I love that right. analogy. I'm going to be using it. Totally. And by the way, that's the actually heel right now of the industry mm -hmm. is the inference cost of running these models. Mm -hmm. Like many people don't realize that that cost is very high to just run them. Not tra forget about tra training is high and as well. Even higher. But running is, is going to be ongoing forever. As Yanqing pointed out, the most companies have not collected the revenue, their new revenue exactly. yet, exactly. Yeah. right? So inference cost matters. So you have to right. lower the inference cost as much as you can. So at Victoria, we spent a lot of time optimizing our entire stack on the inference side, leveraging certain chips from AWS called the Inferentia chips, which bring down the cost of inference significantly, but that's the Camry, the Camry option, right? <laughs> or right. the cheaper yeah. option, right? So right. You, you still have to balance these things, but if you're not cognizant of it, the cost of the system is not gonna work for the use case you're after. And this is where the solutions you provide are we very, can very be like important. really helpful, basically. Yeah. yeah. So even oh, though the two yeah. of you are the, uh, doing the software stack, but you have mm -hmm. PhDs, computer science for a long time, now you see this, you know, craziness of the, you know, the Nvidia, Nvidia, uh, with the stock price, as well as you know the demand, right? More important, the demand for the GPU. Mm -hmm. Do you see a demand shifting, you know, or this is a, you, you kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier, right? You know, there's a build out in the early days, but do you see that alternative with AMD or other hardware being, you know, pretty, um, you know, practical? Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, what do you see? Um, 
I think there's definitely like an opportunity for hardware vendors to be uh, more diversifying. So the reason is basically, um, if I were to answer this question 10 years ago, I would basically say NVIDIA has the, uh, like, like the absolute dominance. Mainly because people really don't think about hardware as hardware. People think about hardware as hardware and software combined. Correct. Um, in the CPU world, basically there's XK86 and, and things like that. So we don't really worry too much about what kind of instruction sets are down there. We worry about the C language or Python or things like that or Java. Right. And then basically in the, in the, in the AI world, then basically um, 15 years ago, or actually 20 years ago, NVIDIA started this CUDA library. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very C-like language that average software engineers will be able to learn in uh, an hour and then start writing their own first parallel program. And they're like, I was like, I was awesome, right? <laughs> and it's not that me being awesome, it's because there's an excellent software abstraction that allowed people to interface with this hardware really efficiently and effectively. Um, so when CUDA, you wrote the cafe was on top of was complete on CUDA. The whole AI software stack today, for better or worse, is built on, on CUDA. Yeah. Now, the biggest dominance is because of CUDA. Exactly. It's not yeah, because right. of the Lizelicon. But the actually also quite, quite fast at all, but yeah, yeah, CUDA yeah. is like a dominant yeah. impact. Yeah, exactly. Right. The, yeah. The, yeah, the stickiness yeah. comes from CUDA. Exactly. Yeah. So, so then that's why when people are basically writing random programs and things like that, CUDA is like the absolute limiting fact. Well, not limiting fact, sorry. CUDA is basically the barrier preventing others from going into, you know, coming into the field. Mm -hmm. Now, today things are slightly different, mainly because people are actually moving up stacks. Instead of basically writing, say, like convolutions or things like that, which are components in those models, people are like, I just want a Llama model run. And so inside it, there's quite a lot of optimizations that one can do without disturbing the development flow of the algorithm engineers, right? And so basically, I think, you know, and also over the years, then people are actually also um, catching up with NVIDIA on, by providing CUDA-compatible uh, drivers like SDKs and things like that. Notably, AMD has this library called Rockam, or the technical name is Hippify. Mm -hmm. They take the CUDA code, they Hippify it to basically be able to mm -hmm. run on AMD hardware. Mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, um, I think there's still quite a few months, years, I'm not quite sure, hopefully things get fast. Um, there's still some time for people to be comfortable with the compatibility layer. Yep. These kind of things happened in the past with varied successes. Mm -hmm. For example, Java, well, Oracle, and Google has this like famous debate and things like that, which yep. actually made it an open standard. Mm -hmm. There's also kind of like hardware pieces that didn't pan out, such as Transmeta, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically to try yep. to emulate yep. x86. That's right. So I think it's an open field. There's so much interest today that something good is coming out of for sure. Yeah. So so I I would say two things. First. The need for a semiconductor that can do uh, AI at scale will continue for many, many years to come. That, that market is, is absolutely going to be uh, one of the most healthy markets in the future. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But that's different on whether NVIDIA can be the dominant player in that market uh, going forward forever. Uh, that's a very big question. Uh, the, 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 the thing holding, it, holding back the other solutions today is exactly having a good compatibility layer that mm -hmm. can span these. You mentioned a couple of good options. Another one is Mojo, right? Mojo is great, yeah. So Mo Mojo is going to add an abstraction layer that makes yeah. it very easy. Once I program for once, I can deploy on AMD. I can deploy on other kind of architectures as well. There's a number of startups, as you know, building very, very cool stuff in that space. My prediction, and I could be wrong, but my prediction is NVIDIA will get nvidia -ed. So what, what do I mean by NVIDIA will get nvidia -ed? There was a company called Silicon Graphics. Mm. Mm. Do you remember Silicon Graphics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Silicon Graphics were selling these $20,000, $30,000 workstations for doing graphics work. And they were very expensive. They were charging money left and right. They were doing very well. And then NVIDIA came in and said, forget about that. Here is a very cheap 300 graphics uh, $300 and graphics card. Jason saw the opportunity yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Here is a $300 graphics card that you can plug into a PC, and you have a more powerful workstation than, than what Silicon Graphics sells you for a fraction of the price. And essentially, NVIDIA killed Silicon Graphics. So, that, so uh, that's why when I'm saying, right, NVIDIA will get nvidia what I mean, there will be a company, and there are a bunch of companies that will come out because they see the opportunity of the silicon that will create very, very good, if not better, solutions for doing AI on, uh, on semiconductors. And at that time, the NVIDIA uh, market share will get corrected a bit. But right now, we're at the beginning of the bubble, exactly what happened uh, back then in the internet. And that's why you're getting this very rich, uh, frothy valuations, but that will converge toward what makes sense in the future. As long as we figure out that abstraction layer right. that makes it easy to deploy what we're working on across these different modalities and not this CUDA lock-in into NVIDIA as the only choice. And uh, mm -hmm. both of you think you know, CUDA lock-in will disappear in the next few years. Yes. 
because you know mm -hmm. startup will innovate, will give you the compatibility layer. Mm -hmm. People may companies. not be comfortable about it today, but people yeah. will be comfortable. Yeah, about Intel is not standing mm -hmm. still. Uh, Arm is not standing still. AMD is not standing still. They all know that this is where the money is. Right. Right. So they're all building amazing new things on the software side that we, we'll see very soon, uh, like the ones you hinted to about AMD. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I like the analogy. Who's to NVIDIA today? Like NVIDIA to yeah. SGI exactly. 30 years ago. <laughs> yes. right. exactly. So history, you know, will always repeat. Yeah. Right? Like um, you see the Grok, there's a, there's a semiconductor company called Grok. Yeah. If you're yeah, following yeah. them, they seem to be doing, doing right. very well. Very good. Absolute uh, fastest speed in the market right yeah. now. On the inference side, they're just amazing. And then uh, what's the name of the company that makes the mega, mega chips? Uh, Cerberus? Uh, uh, Cerberus, right, yeah. yeah. So there's a company called Cerberus, they make these chips this big, mm -hmm. um, f full, of, uh, full of cores, and they seem to be doing very well as well. So right. yeah. I think there's a number of really good solutions coming right. up. We yep. just need better, uh, UI, uh, better uh, programming interfaces against them. Right. Right. That's yeah. all. I think also like the hardware land is like there's a lot of parameters to explore. So basically yeah. Cerberus is basically saying, instead of right, uh, like building smaller chips, why don't we just go big and yeah. really yeah. big, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then basically like uh, Grok is basically saying, why don't I use SRAM and a lot of fast compute? Yeah. On, and uh, there's another company called Sensei Manova, mm -hmm. which is basically saying, why don't we yeah. just have a large amount of like memory and then basically fast compute? Yeah. And those kind of parameters, I think, you know, like only one company wouldn't be able to explore them all. Exactly. And surely there's going to be some interesting results coming out of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, Jensen actually recently said, you know, he thought uh, CUDA would have an overnight success, you know, 2006. Yeah. But of course, you know, it took a few more years. Yeah. Right. You know, the, those companies you mentioned, right? You know, they could, not, they may not be, you know, that, you know, thriving today, but you know. Mm -hmm. There's there are enough opportunities for yeah. Them. There's no question the printer is there. The, 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 the only thing I would not debate is is, is semiconductor for uh, AI going to be a flourishing market for many years to come? Hundred percent. Okay. Hundred percent. Right. So history will repeat. <laughs> so speaking of the history, right? You know, we are kind of uh, on the in a different phase for the cloud, right? Uh, Yang Qing, you and I had a conversation mm -hmm. before about right. you know what is the what is the new cloud, right? Because mm -hmm. you know cloud we knew to you know last uh, 10, 15 years, right. you know, will be quite different. Right. Can you share with the audience about your view mm -hmm. about, you know, how the, you know, what's the next ne ne next generation cloud would it look like? Right. Um, I think, you know, like cloud, and to answer this question, we probably need to like have a, a brief review of what cloud did, right? So basically, in the very old days, um, compute is basically a high-performance computation. You have data centers, well, actually like HPC clusters and things like that. Cloud came in the uh, web service or internet era, basically saying instead of having all those kind of crazy compute, what we really need to do is cheap hardware and moving data around as fast as possible. Um, so if you think about the largest cloud provider today, it's called AWS Web Services. Right? So then cloud basically provides two key uh, uh, two key uh, value propositions. One is basically a supply chain. I'm going to be able to give you an, an, an elastic amount of small CPUs. I'll basically break down those big CPU boxes using virtualization and things like that. And then the supply is very elastic CPU machines. The second one is basically cloud allows people to install and acquire and run software as easy as possible. And by software, I mean all those middleware software like, like load balancers, you know, like say message queues, small databases and things like that, log Order. stores and things like that. So cloud is basically saying, hey, de web developers, since I'm basically saving a lot of money and elasticity. How do how about I charge a, a huge premium on top of that? Mm -hmm. And people are like, that's fine because it saves me people time, right? Now today AI is coming back as an HPC kind of world that disrupts these two key value propositions. Supply chain, we all know that is kind of you know it's tricky, and it's not only just buying small pieces of things. GPUs, for better or worse, today cannot be re really be virtualized into like small chunks of compute, and uh, you can't really repurpose GPUs to other like say databases or things, or things like that. So it's very specialized in a way that people start being very careful in budgeting, planning, and operation of these GPU machines. Mm -hmm. As a result, an elastic supply might come in the future, but doesn't apply immediately right right here, and a cloud surcharge right now would be a little bit tricky to justify. Software-wise, all those middleware is not really too much needed. I mean, they are going to be needed down the road, but not much needed in GPUs because it's JBOG, just a bunch of GPUs, right? Uh, the I.O. isn't too big. You basically have a few kilobytes coming in, tens of seconds of compute, and then a few kilobytes going out. So it's more about optimizing and running the software specifically, PyTorch, Hugging Face Transformers, Fast Transformers, Flash Attention, and all those things in that box. Mm -hmm. So the easy way to acquire and operate software isn't a 
big problem, or it becomes a different problem, how to run those software more efficiently. And as a re result, what we see is there are alternative cloud providers coming up, um, especially on GPUs. So there's Lambda Labs, there is uh, Coreweave. Coreweave, and there's ML Foundry, and a lot of others that, that I forgot to mention. Their challenge, of course, is, is not a cloud native layer, right? It's basically the raw machines similar to the old school Slurm cluster and things like that. Yeah. So I think um, the future of the cloud is going to be a, a hybrid of both. The supply is going to be a more varied suppliers will be able to give you the most cost effective and easy to plan kind of GPU resources. On top of that, the cloud native layer isn't going away anytime soon because we don't want to go back and deal with 64 yeah. IP addresses. Right, so that layer is it's exactly what we have been building, and we see people actually happily utilizing this, what we call the multi-cloud strategy, yep. to actually um, optimize their AI hardware and platform, um, you know, like budgeting and operation really well. Yep. Um, and of course, fast runtime and things like that, where they mentioned it. So I think cloud is, you know, like uh, the cloud nativeness of running things is continuing to stay, and then um, people will, clients basically will have more and more flexibility or sovereignty um, to basically own their own hardware and software and, uh, and the whole stack. So basically, from your, hybrid. from your perspective, the workloads are mm -hmm. going to be uh, already not going to, already very different from the, you know, what we run, exactly. what we ran for cloud for the last 15 right. years. Yeah. And then the demand, the technical demand, right, the kind of the GPU, mm -hmm. the, you know, do you really need uh, scheduling things in and out fast? It's, yeah, it's right. not quite, it's quite mm. different. It's right? different, but, but it's mm. needed though. I mean, like I would say, as you correctly said at the right. beginning, AI is the third pillar. It's, right. It is the third pillar. So we're just at the beginning of it right now, right? So that's why there is still a lot of learning curve go going on. And there's still lots of software services being built that will make it more uh, uniform and, and more reusable. And uh, the, the, the supply problem will so be solved over time, Hopefully, right? So, yeah. so, so I'm a big believer cl cloud is here to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition to the reasons why you might, uh, hybrid will still be here to stay, mm -hmm. in addition to the other reasons that you mentioned, there is also um, the concern about lock-in, which I mentioned earlier. When it mm -hmm. comes to AI and training models, there is a concern if I'm using that cloud to do my training, I'm locked into that cloud. No, I want to be, I want to own this myself in my own hybrid environment. Mm -hmm. So that is a big concern that I that I see uh, creeping up uh, uh, on us in the future. And then if you have any specialized AI models that are built, being built for certain use cases unique to you, then you might be worried from a uh, differentiation point of view of having those being done in in, in the cloud. So Amar, you you know you started you founded a Cloudera, right? You know, Cloudera probably is the first company, uh, Silicon Valley startup with a name, you know, with a phrase, cloud in it. So I'm pretty sure when you start a company, you were thinking about cloud a lot, right? Cloud era, I have mm -hmm. to believe that's the reason. Yep. What is the key difference between the cloud that you imagined back 2008 versus today? Like, a, can you, can you give it, because you, you have a lot of perspective, you know. Yeah, I mean, first I would say the genesis of Cloudera was actually on-premise software, not cloud software. But the goal well, Why was, did you name it Yeah, yeah cloud? because the goal was to enable organizations to be cloud native, meaning, meaning they have architecture inside of their organization in their own data centers that scales up and scales down, and the developers are uh, thinking in a serverless way. They don't, they don't have to think about how many servers I need to finish this job. They just think about the job, and then the... The, the cloud native infrastructure takes care of handling that for you. So essentially, uh, Cloudera was about bringing the cloud benefits. Cloud benefits, on cloud the characteristics. Yes, to be, to be with you on-premise. And you have to be also, um, you have to recall, Cloudera was starting in 2008 when the public cloud was still not a thing, actually. It was still being uh, formed. Like a, 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 it was a toy. Yeah, exactly. It was an experiment back, back then. Uh, today, clearly, the public cloud, for all the great reasons Hong Jing mentioned, is winning. There is no question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it gives you lots of elasticity. You can go and ask for a thousand servers, and you can get the thousand servers over a few minutes. You can uh, program across many, many different types of microservices available to you. There's so many benefits to working in the cloud. Uh, Victara, we are 100% cloud. Like, we don't have any on-prem, like, it's all of our infrastructure is running in, in the so cloud. you have way more conviction in public cloud at this yeah. time around. But, right? but the only problem, the only caveat I would give, uh, as I mentioned, lock-in earlier. Lock-in is a concern. If you have a specialized use case that the cloud is not ready for because the AI market still is in infancy, then, then the cloud might not be ready for your use case. And third, unfortunately, deglobalization is affecting the cloud right now. 
And what I mean by deglobalization, meaning the lack of trust between different countries is starting to really kick in, and especially after the Russia-Ukraine war, where we and the US, we shut down many services away from Russia, right? Including the cloud services. So there's many other countries across the world right now worried like, should we be using US cloud, uh, Amazon and Google and Microsoft when they could turn that on us if we don't agree with them? Or, like this. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, some, uh, there's some tension happening in the world right now because of that. There are some countries in the European Union, for example, that are mandating that the, plig, the big cloud providers have to build cloud versions that are managed by somebody else in the country just in case in the future there's a conflict, then they can tell them, okay, goodbye, we're gonna manage this cloud ourselves. Don't give us the new versions of the software, but we can take this now and run with it. So that's my only concern with the health of the cloud in the future is whether we as a world can go back to trusting each other versus distrusting each other. Right, in some ways it's kind of a deep cloud or a deep public cloud, a sort of <laughs> or yeah, a wave with that. Deglobalization and deglobalization. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. So, that's cloud, right? You know, and then I'm a believer in cloud. I want to say I'm a believer in cloud. So you I'm believed in that. public cloud, yes, way more than you know, yes. more than a decade ago. Yes, um, but you know, we are in a very different world, yes. right? Geopolitics, yep. you know, all that kind of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay, so we talked about the um, you know building AI, deploying AI. We also talked about the cloud, right? The future of the cloud. So let's talk about open source, right? You know, both of you have years of experiences in open source, yes. right? You know, mm -hmm. Hadoop, right? Yeah. You know, no, in some ways, you know, the, uh, I don't know, Hadoop is such an important stack um, for the entire yeah. Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you, are the, you, are, you are the person who first, uh, you know, commercialized uh, uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure you learned a lot from this journey. Can mm -hmm. you share with the audience, you know, first, uh, the, the kind of learning you have and how do you apply this learning in your new company, right? This is your third company. You know, how do you apply that learning in this company? Yeah. So it's very simple. So open source is very useful in uh, distribution, meaning getting your attention and getting you developers using you and leveraging you. It's very good for that, right? So it gives you almost like free marketing. You can think about that way. That can be very viral as well. That can allow you to grow very quickly. That's the benefits of open source. The main benefit of open source, to be, to be honest. You get a secondary benefit, which some of these developers might contribute to the code and help you make the code But better. that's a distant second. That's a distant second. It doesn't always happen, to be, to, to be very blunt. <laughs> like at Cloudera, we still carry the most of the workload of making sure the system evolves in a healthy way. Uh, same thing, Red Hat with Linux, they carried most of the, wor the, the, the workload for Linux. Now, the problem with open source is twofold. Uh, first, there are some big companies without mentioning names, big cloud vendors without mentioning names, uh, their name starts with an A, <laughs> that we call vampires. They just take, take, take. They never give back, right? They just take the open source. So as soon as you put things, something out in open source, they launch a competing version in their cloud, and you can't compete with them because you're going to go and say, I'm going to be more secure. No, you're not going to be more secure than them. I'm going to be more reliable. You're not going to be more reliable than them. They own you. They, they have the underlying infrastructure. Right. So it's very hard. And to then they are good at uh, scaling it. And they're very good at scaling it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So and, and at selling it as well. So, yes. so, 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 so uh, immediately you put yourself at a disadvantage as soon as you do that. This, the, the other concern, which is more uh, after this primary one, is your customers become your competitors with open source. Like many times we'll have customers deploying tens of thousands of nodes of our Cloudera open source, but will tell us, instead of paying you uh, $5 million per year to maintain the software, we're just gonna go hire three, four engineers and have them do that. So, so now your customer becomes your competitor. They're saying, we run your software ourselves. Uh, or we'll go get Accenture and have Accenture do this for us instead. So, so the key point is it's very hard to monetize open source because of these effects. So you have to be very careful what you open source and what you don't open source. I used to be a fan of what's called open core, uh, open source models, where your core is open, but then you have things around the core like management and security that are not. Uh, I now shifted my uh, views that the right model for open source monetization wise. By the way, you shifted it because of all the reason you mentioned. Yes, yes, right. because of all of my experience with Caldera, right. I shifted my view now to be no, to create a successful business around open source, you need to be open perimeter, not open core. So your core needs to be closed, and then you have things around your perimeter which are open that help you build the, the community. If you open source your core, then that big, big company that shall not be named or your, your customers will become your competitors.
very quickly. Very interesting. Yeah. So f as an example, you are, uh, what, what sort of things did you... Yeah, so one of the things we open source is our hallucination evaluation model, which that sits at the periphery of our system. It's not in the core of our system. And it's just one of the pieces that make the entire... Now, what's model. the value for you in this case? It, the value is the distribution, the marketing. And you get attention, yeah. you get a exactly. lead generation, exactly. marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get developers, branding, knowing about you. Like, as I mentioned earlier, the hallucination model we released is the number one model on uh, Hugging Face right now. If you search for ah. hallucination, it's the number one model. We also released the leaderboard, which ranks all of the large language models by their hallucination rates. It's now becoming the benchmark, the industry benchmark, for how other companies, when they release their generative models, benchmark their hallucination rates. So that now ba accrues back to you as a company a reputation that you're good at that thing. Right? And developers begin to know you that, hey, if I need to reduce hallucinations, I can go grab the model from Hugging Face and try to do it myself, or I can just plug in Vectora and, and it just works out of the box right away. So it brings you the distribution without giving away your core value, which is the platform end-to-end -end that you have built. So you shifted from, you know, I open sourced the core part of it, but I'll figure out some monetization, in, you know, to where you, you, know, you start with, you know, uh, close source things, however, selectively, thoughtfully, um, open source certain components exactly. to still get attention, marketing yeah. value out of it, but it's two very different models. Exactly. Very interesting. Yeah. Again, that's my opinion. It's an experiment. We'll mm. see if it works. There's many examples of it working. Like, again, so Cloudera was limited in how much it was able to grow because of this. Like, Cloudera right now is, I think, around 2 billion ARR in revenue every year. Uh, Red Hat which was pure open source, also was limited for how much it has to grow. But if you look at other companies that did the open perimeter, like Datadog, Datadog, all of the connections that you build, the libraries to connect and instrument your flow into Datadog is open source and free. And you can go see it on GitHub and grab it. But the core of the Datadog platform is completely pr proprietary. Look at the valuation of Datadog as a business and how much money they're making. It's way, way higher. So the evidence is kind of leaning towards this thesis I have, that open perimeter is a more successful business model than, than open core. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yangqing, you also have a lot of insights. When right. Omar mentioned about open parameter, a few mm -hmm. things, I was thinking about a few you know, things you talked to me about right. it. Yeah. So can right. you share with our yeah. audience about I, it? I, I absolutely agree that basically open core model is like going to like be very different. Um, so I think you know, like in the past, basically, well, when we're thinking about deploying software and making business around open source software, the idea is the core is open, the tool chain is open, and then we sell basically SREs in some way, operation. Yeah. Operation is kind of like tricky and dirty and people don't want to do it. Um, what happened in the last 15 years is basically cloud providers just made it really easy. And cloud native software such as Kubernetes made it really easy. So, um, and also companies such as like AWS and, uh, and the other A that I served in the past, <laughs> right? We were able to basically reduce the cost drastically because of the scale. And also because we sell hardware and things like that, we can actually massively subsidize the software side cost, right? And as a result, basically open core being a business no longer applies basically because copycats, or basically whoever who's able to just copy open source and just like reduce the cost of SRE is going to be just like winning that small margin. Um, exactly. So open parameter is one defi definitely one like really interesting way to go, go for it. Um, basically like building solutions that are actually you know, like still kind of tedious and difficult for people to, to run themselves and also having special knowledge about how do we actually like make sure that hallucination, hallucination is properly monitored. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing, as a, as, a, as a kind of like a runtime system provider, what I see is basically in addition, in, instead of open core, it becomes open standard. Uh, so if you think about Databricks, um, which is massively successful, they started with, with Spark, and then, I mean, everyone has Spark, right? EMR and things like that on every single cloud platform. Um, and Databricks, instead of basically continuing going open core, it basically says, well, you know what? The standard, the interface is the same, but we have a much faster runtime called yeah. Photon, and this is our key advantage over the uh, open source versions. Open source version is still great if you want to run it and at low cost, it's still okay. But if you go my proprietary version, I'm going to be able to do three to, to, to five times faster, right? And, um, and I think a lot of the open source companies today actually start doing it. In the AI world, Mistral is doing the same as well. There's the open source Mistral model and Mixtral model, and they were like, we have a larger model and more intelligent that is proprietary. That's the medium, open source, that's Mistral medium. That's Mistral medium and yeah. large and things like that, yeah. right? Basically, they use open source in the old, in the, um, in the old classic way. Mm -hmm. Use open source to basically attract traffic, marketing, uh, uh, market leadership kind of positions, and then they were like, we have an even better version. Mm -hmm. Now, this, of course, actually brings a lot of challenge to these companies because they need to produce an open source version that is at or 
hopefully slightly better than the market standard. Yeah. And on top of that, there will be even a proprietary like, version. Yeah, they need, need to have a proprietary version that's yeah. even better. Yeah. Right. So that is much Hard. difficult than you know, like basically like the old open core model. But I mean, you know, like it's it's good for the society because yeah. like it pushes things forward. Yeah. So I think you know, like open parameter is basically like the application side story, and mm -hmm. on the system side story, I think the similar kind of like story yeah, is basically that, open gonna standard. Call, I'm going to call that dual core. Dual core, right? Meaning Something you like have that. two cores. One core right. which is open, that's what you give the market, right? And one core which is way better, <laughs> that is proprietary, <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. how you pull in the market. So right. multi core, right. but same interface. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah same yeah, interface, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, with that, you felt mm -hmm. like uh, that is the better model. You know, mm -hmm. it poses some challenge in terms of the. It demands not pose challenge. It demands more innovation, right? It demands more innovation, yeah. exactly. Right. The good thing, the difference between this versus the old completely proprietary software is that lock-in effect gets like less, right? It's just a cost play. You are paying intelligent people for their hard work, and if you don't really want to, you then you can back. have a slightly like less performant version, but still open. You're not going to be just like killing your business because you're not going their way. Mm -hmm. And that gives people peace of mind, and it's like more collaborative than the old proprietary software way, where if that provider company dies, then you know, all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. right. So how do you apply this philosophy in your own business? Yeah, right. So um, well, I, we We've actually built a, built a really fast runtime for LLMs and IGCs and things like that. The interface is, is completely compatible with, in you know, like, say, the OpenAI standard, which arguably is open, right? Or the OpenAI's runtime yeah. is closed. And also, there are also kind of like closed, closed software such as like VL, well, so, sorry, there are other open source software such as VLLM, which is basically also like provide interfaces. So the interface is exactly the same. Uh, for example, on Lepton, you'll be able to just like give me the, the hugging face model string. And then automatically, it gives you an OpenAI compatible endpoint that you can run. Mm. Now, if you don't really want to go with Lepton, then that whole thing, that interface is exactly the same, right? You can pull up a GPU, and then we basically just you know, like provide value and make business because we have a high performance, high, more stable kind of runtime. Mm. So I think that's kind of like the way. We're still thinking about whether we want to like contribute back some of our pieces because we love open source, and then you know, like it's also from Berkeley and things like that. Mm. Um, we, we're kind of like finding the balance mainly because you know, like also it's a, it's a people play, basically. Uh, with a small startup, um, we, we kind of feel that like it's irresponsible mm -hmm. to throw things over the fence and yeah. not maintain it. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we're working with open source communities such as VLM to basically see what is the best way we, contribu we can contribute. But um, I think you know, like, um, at the end of the day, we want to basically achieve such a position where we help the open source community and we contribute back. Help is a, is, is a self aggregate word. Um, we contribute back to the open source community by raising the bar mm -hmm. of the technical uh, stack, mm -hmm. and at the same time still keeping an advantage by you know, like always staying ahead. So before we finish, I wanted yeah. to ask a few you know, questions that everyone is discussing in Silicon Valley, right? You know, right. The AGI, when is AGI going to happen? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, any take on that? Uh, 2029. 2029, <laughs> yeah. um, which month? <laughs> <laughs> so why 2029? Uh, that's, most, that's what most of the trends and data are pointing towards. If you look at the rate of growth of how it's accelerating over the last few years. Uh, and then also Ray Coswell, who, who pre uh, predicted when it would happen, uh, he's, he, he revised, he, he, I think his original prediction was in the mid-30s, and he just revised his predictions recently and said 2029. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what he's predicting. Yang Qing? Right. Uh, I would probably have some like, a little bit of controversial answer, which is like, never. Yeah. Uh, the reason is, I think, and intelligence has always implicitly been defined as anything that is not artificial. So in that sense, basically in like AGI or GI, I guess, like AGI is never going to be just like general intelligence. And I've also worked with uh, the Berkeley, uh, some Berkeley psychological professors, really smart uh, leaders in this field. And uh, what, we, what, what we found is basically like there are quite a lot of things that are, um, uh, that are not only, you know, like, like, like just like computational. It's more about like our experience and interaction with the world and, and, and other people and things like that. Emotion. Emotion and also like it's the social contract uh, that's only mm. built through interactions. Like right. even like how do we define things? What is a cup? Is a cup a black cup? That's this like old classical question like is white horse horse, right? Something like that. All those kind of things are actually built with human interactions and things like that. Now I'm sure in the, in the future there's gonna be like a, ro a robot society where they figure out their social contracts and things like that. But I kind of feel that basically like general intelligence as human always have a little bit like, a little bit beyond pure computation. And uh, yeah, I'm very okay. hopeful. So that's AGI. What about, you know, Jason Huang advised the kids not to learn coding <laughs> the other day. What's your take, right? You know, should people still learn coding? 
I think I think he wasn't saying. I, I think it's a mischaracter. I, I listened to that segment of his, mm -hmm. and I think his key advice is not, don't learn coding. His key his key advice is, the new generation needs to learn how to learn. What's yeah. more important is to sure. learn how to learn, mm -hmm. because you will need to readapt very quickly. That we had the luxury in our generation that we can keep the same job for 40 years and 50 years. They might not have that. The job might disappear in their lifetime. So they will need to have the ability to learn something and use I agree. I think his uh, emphasis really, coding is not the only thing yes. you need to learn. If yeah. you only know coding, you can get a job at Google, Facebook. That days are going to be gone yeah. soon. Yes. Right. I, I agree with you. Yes. Right. But in terms of the advice, in terms of the, what to learn, anything from your point of view, yeah, so, so, I mean, so first, learn to learn is, a, is an, a skill set that we, all of our kids, we have, be, we have to be very focused on giving that uh, curiosity and hunger to find out how things work and, and learn things for learning's sake. And, and, and to really refine that skill, that you're never going to stop learning. Your entire life, you need to be learning, adapting, and evolving. Then that Otherwise was true before, better. and that's going to be a lot even, more true. Even more important. More true. Way more important in, in, in the future. So that's my key advice, like... The summary advice that I, that I would give. Now, on the coding question, the advanced coders, meaning the system architects, the developers, no, we still need those. Like, uh, the technology we have today is not good at that. It's okay, but it's not really good at that. Uh, the, the building a small function here, a small function there, and even a group of functions, yes, that's going to go away, which that means for the, the younger generation, it will be much harder for them to find jobs because of that. The, the more experienced generation will still have jobs for a number of years because that's where you have the architecture, higher level, uh, concepts coming into play and maybe new algorithm design or whatever but the, the the younger generation that simply were doing implementation of functions and implementation of uh, small projects yeah that that is going to go away so from that point of view ai is replacing some developers in the near Absolute, future many developers many developers many developers yes right. yang Qing, yeah. your thoughts I have, a, I have a mixed feeling about this and i, de I definitely agree with uh, with learn to learn kind of argument yeah. and once in society wise is like in the past a lot of these kind of like job changes happen over multiple decades of people. For example, farming is no longer one of the biggest like like employer category in the US anymore. Yep. But that then happened over the process of 150 years. And even that we've we've seen horrible stories in you know like in history books about like how people lose jobs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Today I think AI is evolving so fast that you know like things that we learned 20 years ago is very quickly becoming irrelevant yes right now um it's fine to basically sw switch job categories within like over multiple generations of people but if if I know that after I graduate from college, then my job, my, my, my skill set is already relevant, that brings a lot of uneasiness or basically like mm -hmm. uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I think as a society, we probably need to like think more about this. Um, in general, well, it's a smart society. Hopefully, like we figure it out. Do you see AI replacing the, the, the developers already soon or not anytime soon? Um, I mean, it's replacing half of me. For sure, <laughs> which is for me, it's a good thing because yeah. I have time to basically think about other like architecture applications and things like that. But yeah, it's definitely but, but something. Do you see that, that it's <coughs> already reducing junior developers' job today? It is. I think it is. Yeah. Although wow. we got smart people, so um, Lepton isn't endangered. But uh, but yeah, definitely as a market, it's trickier. It's like changing very fast. Yeah. Wow, it's a fantastic hour. Any last minute, last second uh, word that you want to leave with our audience? You want to go first. Um, I don't know. Yeah, embrace future. It's it's really great. I mean, embrace AI. Yeah, embrace AI. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would say again, if you if you were trying to implement uh, AI within your organization, and you have been uh, relying on your team, but you know, you're very worried now about hallucinations because you're seeing it. You're very worried about copyright infringement. You're very worried about bias. You're very worried about security. Then please reach out to Victoria. <laughs> so thank you, Amar and the Yang Qing. Uh, we had a, such a wonderful conversation about you know why it's so complex to write the Gen AI applications, to deploy it at scale, right? What's the next generation of the cloud? The workload that would it look like? You know, strategy in open source, and of course, you know, last but not least, the AGI, whether AI is replacing developers or not. Thank you so much, and uh, you know, uh, it's a wonderful hour. Thank you. We really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much. This was great. Okay, thank you everyone for watching SuperCloud 6 AI Founder Panel.